Welcome to class 33 in topics in power electronics and distributed generation. We have been looking at uh, the dynamic thermal models of uh, IGBT module and we have seen that it is important to evaluate the junction temperature of the semiconductor chips, uh, transistors, diodes, etc. And uh, to do that, we looked at concepts of uh, thermal resistance, thermal capacitance and how to model it as a equivalent uh, electric, electrical circuit. And we saw that the electrical circuit uh, can be mapped to a, a, a network of, uh, of uh, to look at the steady state behavior of the of such a structure of the thermal management system. And uh, to look at the dynamic thermal uh, characteristics, one can then look at uh, a, 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 a core network which looks like the physical RC networks that would correspond to the physical uh, uh, thermal characteristics of the multiple components that go into the IGBT module. Uh, the points of interest would essentially be your junction temperature, maybe your case temperature, uh, sink temperature or the ambient and uh, often in a power module, uh, the case temperature, the data sheets provide uh, transient thermal impedance characteristics for a fixed case temperature and you are looking at the transfer function between your junction temperature to case temperature and the same behavior can be obtained from a equivalent uh, Foster network uh, from again from the junction temperature point of view. Uh, so, the intermediate nodes of the Foster network may not make much uh, physical sense, but from a terminal point of view the behavior of the Foster network is uh, similar to that of the cover network. Uh, the number of RC elements can be typically it is between 2 and 6, the number of elements can be higher to get a better approximation to the res thermal response characteristics of your measured uh, mesh measurements with your model of the thermal system. The data sheets provide typically the, the Foster network parameters or as some data sheets may just provide the transient thermal impedance curve. And we saw that uh, connecting the module uh, together with the heat sink one has to make transformations between the Foster and the cover networks. So, if you want to analyze the, the Foster and cover network, then one has to look at uh, how the impedance can be evaluated for each of this. So, we will look at a Foster network uh, as a recursive unit and if you look at uh, the impedance of the nth recursive uh, unit of the Foster network Z F T H of a nth unit is 1 by R n plus S C n plus Z of the Foster network of the previous stage. So, if you uh, looking at it, this is the impedance of the Foster network subsequent to the nth unit and you are adding the nth component to it to get the uh, Foster impedance at the nth stage. If you look at, uh, so you can uh, write this as 1 by uh, C n divided by S plus 1 by R n C n plus Z f t h at n minus 1. So, in a similar manner we have z f t h of n minus 1 can be written 1 by c n minus 1 by s plus by r n minus 1 c n minus 1 plus z f t h of n minus 2. So, you could write a general expression for the Foster network to be of the form
with n sections So, if you look at the form of this expression, this is essentially a, a partial uh, fraction expansion of the transfer function. If you write z f t h to be a, 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 a ratio of polynomials p n of s by q n of s, then essentially it is the partial fraction expansion of such a polynomial. You could also then look at uh, what is the the recursive unit for uh, a core network. So, es essentially you are looking at z c t h at the nth stage in terms of the r r n c n parameters and z z t h of the n minus 1 stage. So, you have a capacitance in parallel with uh, the resistance plus your subsequent network uh, uh, impedance. So, it is 1 by S C n plus R n plus Z C T H of n minus 1 and you can write Z Z T H of n minus 1. So, if you look at the structure of the impedance, the general expression for a core network with n stages, you can write uh, z z t h of n is 1 by s c n plus 1 by r n plus 1 by s c n minus 1 plus 1 by r n minus 1 plus essentially this would continue along. So, this structure of this is of the form of a continuing fraction. So, if you have uh, impedance that is provided to you as a foster network impedance and you would like to transform it to a core network. We let uh, the foster network that is provided to you Z F t h of n be the ratio of polynomials p of n of s by q n of s and for uh, thermal systems you would have p n of s to be a polynomial of degree 1 less than the denominator polynomial q n of s. Okay. So, we know that uh, the foster to core transformation the cover impedance would also be equal to the same ratio. So, this is also equal to z z uh, t h of n. So, you could then evaluate your uh, cover network uh, one look at 1 by z f t h of n which is 1 by z c t h of n which is q n of s by p n of s and because uh, q n is 1 degree higher than p n, you can write it as some s c n, you can take the s outside plus 
1 by R n plus Z T H uh, So, essentially we have written this S C n plus 1 by R n plus Z C T H from our structure of essentially the cover network which we know is of this particular form. Okay. So, you could also now we know that Q n of n is uh, 1 degree higher than P n. So, you could apply Euclid's uh, long division for polynomials to get Q n of s by P n of s equal to s C n prime plus K n plus essentially the remainder of the di division by P n of s. Now, you the remainder of uh, the division would be 1 degree lower than the degree of uh, P n of s. So, if you compare this expression with that, we know that now uh, C n is equal to C n prime. So, essentially uh, the coefficient of s in the numerator of uh, uh, in our quotient gives the capacitance and we will have to look at what is uh, how K n can be related to our resistance. Okay. So, if you then again compare this particular form with the cover uh, recursive unit which is essentially if you look at uh, this particular term over here when you are looking at 1 by Z T H you would have S C N plus 1 by this particular term in the denominator. So, we have our R n plus Z T H of n minus 1 is 1 by K n plus remainder of S divided by P n of S. So, you could then rewrite this particular expression in the form this would also be equal to 1 by k n minus remainder of s remainder at stage n So, essentially if you simplify this particular expression you will get it to be the same as this expression. Okay. So, again if you now compare this with our uh, uh, the expression of uh, impedance of our cover uh, recursive unit you can see that uh, the 1 by k term now would correspond to R n. Okay, in this particular, if you look at compare these two expressions, you will see that 1 by k n corresponds to R n. And your Z uh, C T H of n minus 1 is this second term over here which is minus remainder n of s by k n divided by k n p n of s plus remainder n of s. So, this is essentially your p n minus 1 of s by q n minus 1 of s. So, you apply the same procedure at the next level. So, you will get the terms for C n minus 1 and R n minus 1 till you reach the first uh, C 1 and R 1. So, you would essentially be able to get the R and C parameters of your cover uh, network.
So, the uh, other question is how to if you are given a network which is in the cover form, how to transform it to the foster form. So, you are given say z c t h of a n is p n of s by q n of s. So, to actually uh, do such a transformation what you would do is first uh, determine roots of q n of s. So, this would be your time constants 1 by r i c i and then you do a partial fraction expansion of p n of s by q n of s. So, you find the residues of the partial fraction expansion p n of s by q n of s. So, tau i is uh, so, so your uh, your uh, uh, 1 by 1 by c i would correspond to your uh, uh, so, this 1 by r c is your omega i. So, you from your roots of your expre expression you can find what your r c terms are and from your k i terms which are the residues of your partial fraction expansion you know what your uh, c i s are which are essentially 1 by k i. So, once you have the ability to go from one form the foster form to the curve form and back you can actually build the overall uh, thermal impedance network of your power module, your interface layer and the heat sink and uh, get the overall uh, thermal equivalent uh, uh, model for uh, which can be used for dynamic thermal evaluation. So, essentially what you would have is a dynamic thermal model for your uh, junction temperature to uh, your sink. So, this would be your, your T T j of your semiconductor uh, switch, this would be uh, T of your case and this point would be T of your sink and this point is the ambient temperature. Similarly, you could determine the, the T j of your diode and similarly for the remaining switches that are located within your power module. If you have multiple power modules now located on the same heat sink, you could add more modules uh, to the same heat sink. Your thermal interface material is essentially a very thin layer of the order of tens of microns. So, uh, it, it has considerable thermal resistance, but uh, not much thermal capacitance. So, you might be able to make use of a simplified model for that. Your models for your uh, the power module would have some thermal heat capacity and some dynamics associated with it and your typical power modules can have uh, thermal time constants which can be of the range of um, even up to hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, you look at the uh, thermal dynamics of uh, uh, larger heat sinks it can be of the order of seconds to minutes uh, or uh, very large heat sinks can even take hours to uh, reach thermal equilibrium depending on the cooling that is being used, the form of the cooling that is being used. So, you one would be able to form the overall uh, thermal model of your overall uh, network. Uh, one thing to uh, look at to understand in such a model is that uh, if you are looking at the power loss variation over a fundamental cycle. So, you are talking about 50 milliseconds uh, would be uh, quite small in uh, 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 typical application. So, your T j variation during uh, 50 hertz uh, variation might be of the order of uh, a few degrees centigrade uh, whereas, uh, the time constants involved in the overall response might have uh, considerable effect when you are considering transients that are of the order of uh, hundreds of milliseconds to seconds. So, in applications where say you are starting an induction machine, your motor may take uh, uh, many seconds uh, of 10 seconds to start up, then uh, 
your you might have a overcurrent or a higher current levels during such duration. Uh, you might have say uh, wind turbines where you might have a, a wind gust which can provide more power. So, you might have transient durations where you are having higher power flowing through your, uh, your system. You might have say uh, uh, solar uh, applications where you might have periods of uh, shadows, clouds going across, uh, shadows moving, moving across the system. Uh, you can also have faults in your grid and we saw that uh, for many faults your circuit breakers may take hundreds of milliseconds to operate. So, if you want your power converter to ride through a fault, you might end up having higher current levels for uh, a duration which might be of the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Also in standalone applications, your loads might start up and your inrush currents of your loads might have a, a higher power uh, level. And so, you, so evaluating the dynamic thermal uh, characteristics of the, your semiconductors becomes an important issue. Uh, we also will see that the evaluating the dynamic thermal characteristics has implications on the reliability of the semiconductor. So, for that we will have to look at uh, a closer, uh, take a closer look at the structure of a power semiconductor module. Uh, but before we do that, we will look at uh, uh, some of the issues of uh, reliability and failure in uh, uh, power semiconductors. So, if you have a power semiconductor and you ensure that uh, under all conditions you are operating uh, the device at a voltage less than its rated voltage, even ensuring that the spikes are below your uh, rated voltage, you are ensuring that you are operating always at, at a current level less than the rated current and you are also ensuring that uh, on a steady state and also on a dynamic basis your junction temperature is held below the maximum uh, junction temperature, then one could possibly operate the semiconductor for a very long duration without causing damage. Okay. But uh, practically people have seen that uh, uh, electronic equipment in the field fail and uh, people have uh, ascribed random failure uh, characteristics to it and done statistical analysis to look at uh, uh, attributes such as what is the mean time between failure. So, for a repairable system, uh, mean time between failure uh, so, the MTBF is the time duration uh, uh, when you send out a component uh, get it uh, once you get a component back from repair and the next point uh, when you are actually sending it out for repair. So, the duration between uh, uh, between is the MTBF. Uh, uh, so, these are typically for repairable components. Uh, for many components you might uh, once it is failed it may not be repairable. So, you might have to throw it out or the, the duration under which it is repair would be of no use. So, people also talk about mean time to failure in a DG application when your power converter is down the overall uh, DG system is not generating energy. So, MTTF might actually be a better attribute to look at uh, what is the failure characteristics of a power converter. Uh, another way of looking at uh, failure is failure in time and failure in time is actually uh, a quantity which uh, uh, is uh, one failure. So, having a one FIT implies that you have one failure in 10 to the power of 9 hours. Uh, 10 to the power of 9 hours is actually a very, very long time. Uh, if you convert it into centuries, this corresponds to about 1142 centuries. Okay. So, it is a really long time. Okay. If you look at the, the failure rate at, uh, associated with a IGBT chip, the random failure rate associated with a IGBT chip. So, uh, 
is of the order of 10, uh, your the fit rate for uh, the IGBT gate drive is of the order of 500. So, if you now calculate that into years, this corresponds to about uh, 228 years. If you look at uh, the, the fit rate then for uh, uh, the gate drives of a three phase power converter system. So, you would have six gate drives. So, so you are talking about uh, now uh, 38 years uh, would be the uh, expected say random failure rate. But uh, many times uh, the, uh, the random failure does not give a true picture of when uh, the device might actually fail because uh, if you look at the, the random failures, they correspond to the point where your, your device operates under uh, conditions of low failure rates. So, we know that uh, typical devices have this bathtub curve. So, you are looking at uh, your failure rate. Initially, your failure rate might be high because of infant mortality, but once the, 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 the component enters into service, you would have a low failure rate. And if you are using this particular component to determine your, your random failure rates, but you, uh, you know that you might be underestimating the time because at some point of time, your uh, failure rates would start going up again because of uh, end of life issues. So, it is quite important to actually look at what is the end of life, uh, what is the service life of the equipment uh, due to uh, uh, the end of life effects to get a better picture for how long we could expect a component to actually last. So, if you look at uh, a typical uh, power semiconductor module, you would have uh, aging effects because of a variety of reasons. You might have just a regular material degradation. Because of the temperature effects. So, so, one can one uh, knows that uh, higher temperature can actually degrade material at a faster rate. So, there might be material degradation. Uh, important component of uh, uh, aging is actually thermal cycling. And essentially thermal cycling is because you have a structure of a power module with uh, different materials and you have uh, coefficients of thermal expansion for the different materials that uh, consist uh, that country uh, that go into the power module. And if your device heats up to uh, some T j max the maximum junction temperature, the expansion of the different materials would be uh, different which means that uh, uh, you might end up with uh, structures that want to buckle or uh, change uh, change its shape. Okay. So, one is because of the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch.
Also, another factor to keep in mind is that uh, even if you have closely related uh, uh, thermal coefficient of expansions, your temperature is not uniform. Your adjacent layers might be sitting at different temperatures. So, your junction temperature might be 125, your, your case temperature might be uh, 70 degrees. So, the actual temperature uh, is different across the different layers. So, for example, you might have silicon which uh, uh, might be sitting on top of a uh, uh, ceramic layer and the ceramic layer say you might have your chip sitting on top of a ceramic layer and at 25 degrees centigrade room temperature uh, you might have the silicon chip dimension to be maybe 1 centimeter and that might match your ceramic layer but at 125 degrees centigrade your silicon might expand from say 10, uh, 10 mm to 11 mm, but your ceramic might expand from 10 mm to 12 mm, which means that uh, essentially the two structures are now having a mismatch and it is trying to buckle over or develop cracks at the corners. So, you could have a variety of uh, different uh, 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 concerns when you are operating in such a power module. Uh, you would have uh, stress buildup across uh, layers because of your thermal characteristics and you might have uh, cracks in your dielectric. So, your uh, 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 different points of the di dielectric might expand at different rates and form cracks. Uh, wire bonds that are used to attach the chip to the uh, to your external terminals uh, that is how typically uh, uh, silver or aluminum might have a different expansion coefficient. It might actually break or it might lift off. You have solder joints within the module. So, those points would develop fatigue. Uh, your chip itself might get delaminated from your bottom. Your, uh, your insulation itself might get de 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 delaminated from your base plate and you might end up with uh, lifted dies etcetera. Uh, so, after the uh, after these uh, problems like wire bond lift off, uh, delaminated corners of uh, the chips, you end up with uh, non uniform current density within your uh, chip, which can actually cause even further heating, which can actually further accelerate the temperature related degradation within the power module. Uh, if you look at the overall structure of uh, the power module. Uh, you have essentially the heat sink at the bottom, uh, typically commonly used material for the heat sink might be aluminum, you might also use copper if you are looking at uh, higher uh, heat storage capacity. Uh, you have your thermal interface material or essentially the thermal grease between your base plate and the heat sink, uh, which is a thin layer. You have a base plate and the base plate is essentially the bottom of your module, which you tighten with screws to your heat sink. Uh, commonly used material for the base plate is either copper or uh, people also look at uh, uh, aluminum silicon carbide, which has a better uh, uh, match or with the thermal expansion coefficient of silicon. Uh, above the base plate is actually uh, the ceramic layer. So, the ceramic layer to the base plate is uh, has a direct copper bonding, which is essentially a way of bonding a ceramic to a copper structure. And on the upper side of the ceramic is also uh, direct bonded copper, which is used to ensure, uh, ensure that you get, can do a solder joint between, between your silicon chip to your uh, upper side of your ceramic. So, you have uh, then on top of the DBC layer direct uh, uh, bonded copper, you have a solder layer which is used to connect the, the chips to your uh, bottom of the module. So, essentially if you look at the chip, if it is a, a IGBT chip, the bottom would correspond to the collector. If it is a MOSFET, typically you are looking at the dra uh, drain at the bottom. If you are looking at a diode, it is uh, essentially the cathode 
at the bottom of essentially the module and at the top. So, uh, after that you have the silicon of the chip, uh, on top of that you might have oxides, gate oxides, you might have aluminum metallization for uh, uh, contact to external terminals, you would have wire bonds that are then uh, used to connect to external terminals, you might have passivation layers, uh, you would have potting material and then on top would be the casing, typically a plastic casing to ensure that all these structures are uh, held within the power module. So, you can see that uh, it is a, a sandwich arrangement, often you try to select materials for ceramic, your base plate, for example, the cera ceramic may be aluminum oxide, aluminum nitride, uh, aluminum ni nitride has a better uh, match of thermal expansion coefficient with your, uh, your silicon, so it would be able to withstand uh, more thermal cycling. Okay. So, to look at the, the failure when you have uh, such cycling and uh, 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 structure, uh, one uh, model that is commonly used when you are looking at uh, fatigue failure in um, a, a, a mechanical structure is uh, the coffin manson model which relates the number of uh, cycles to failure to the, 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 the strain that happens within the uh, structure. So, essentially the original model was, uh, was uh, proposed for ductile materials and uh, later on it was seen that you could actually fit the model for brittle structures like uh, silicon chips or ceramic layers etcetera essentially you have a exponential relationship between the number of cycles to failure to the strain that uh, is uh, uh, applied within the object under test. And A naught are and B 1 are essentially uh, coefficients uh, associated with this uh, model. So, so, the again what we are looking at is uh, 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 a situation where you are looking at uh, uh, a strain uh, uh, being the result of a stress being applied on the material and in this particular case the stress that is being applied is your, uh, your temperature of your particular junction and because your temperature has increased to some particular point, your different layers now uh, apply uh, different levels of force at the interface layers and deform the structure. So, typically when you apply a, st a stress on an object, uh, you would initially have something called the elastic range where you take the stress away and it comes back to the normal point. But beyond, a, beyond the uh, yield point, you would essentially have plastic strain range where you apply a stress and you then you take away the stress, you may not actually return back to the original point. So, what is looked at for the cycles to failure is the range for plastic st uh, strain. We, uh, also, we know that the uh, this particular strain range is proportional to the temperature difference of uh, the, the cycles through which you uh, heat up and cool down the temperature, uh, the temperature of the junction. You might have some temperature range corresponding to the elastic uh, stress and then the balance would correspond to the temperature range where you might actually have uh, plastic deformations. So, overall if you look at it the, the delta T naught which might correspond to the temperature variation in the elastic range might be quite small compared to the overall temperature variation. So, you could simplify it to be of the form that the number of cycles to failure depends on your variation of your junction temperatures to some exponent A naught and Q are essentially constants. So, uh, um, some of this uh, uh, effects of uh, temperature cycling people started investigating in the mid 90s and some of the early tests were uh, conducted on uh, traction module uh, tra in traction applications. So, if you have a train uh, or a tram or an electric vehicle, you have 
a situation where when you accelerate at start, you are applying a lot of uh, uh, current uh, through your motors. So, you have a higher power loss. So, once you reach steady, st uh, steady speed, your power uh, uh, level comes down and then when you decelerate, you might be regenerating. So, again the power level can go up and then when you are at stop, your power level is uh, close to zero. So, traction applications and transportation applications see a lot of thermal cycling. So, you need, there are initial cons concerns when IGBT inverters were failing in the field uh, quite rapidly when initially applied in tra uh, traction systems. And some of the initial studies indicated that the number of cycles to failure uh, can be related to uh, the junction temperature and also the mean temperature through some act activation energy type of expressions. And, uh, and uh, one could then make use of uh, expressions such as this to evaluate uh, how many thermal cycles can a uh, given module be used before it actually starts failing. Uh, more recent work uh, related to uh, thermal cycle, uh, cycle failures in IGBT modules have also indicated that there can be dependency on uh, the durations of during which your power loading is being done, the amplitude of the current that is being passed through the connections into the chip your uh, voltage rating of your uh, semiconductor, we saw that the drift region of the semiconductor depends on the, on the voltage rating. So, a thicker chip can have a different thermal cycle compared to a thinner chip. You would also have dependency on the diameter of the wire bond. So, a thicker wire bond might experience uh, uh, a different failure rate compared to a thinner wire bond. So, without we will we'll look at this, uh, this expression uh, or, uh, for the cycles to failure and look at an example to look at uh, how we could use this in a design where you are looking at uh, what should be the maximum junction, ten junction temperature that one could consider when you are uh, looking at a, a design application. So, in this example, we are looking at a load which turns on and off once an hour, uh, 24 hours a day around the year and we are assuming that the thermal steady state is uh, reached quickly. So, uh, so, when it is off, it quickly reaches the ambient temperature of 55 degrees centigrade and the question is when the, the load turns on, what should be the, uh, the system design? Should we choose a TJ max of 125 degrees centigrade or 120 or 110? So, as to ensure that your life of this particular equipment meets your target. So, the parameters for this thermal cycling model used are the exponent being equal to uh, 5, uh, Q the activation energy related term is 7.8 into 10 to the power of 4 joules, R is the gas constant and A naught is uh, 640. So, if you have uh, your T j min which is essentially your ambient temperature when it is off and T j max to be 125, your delta T j would then be 70 degrees and your mean temperature is essentially uh, 125 plus 55 by 2. Uh, in Kelvin this is 363 deg degree centigrade and you can plug this in to uh, the expression over here to evaluate the cycles to failure and, uh, and you can get an expression for then the life of the equipment because we know there is one cycle an hour. So, you take this divided by the number of hours, number of days a, a, a year and you get 7.2 years. So, you can expect life of the order of 7.2 years if you are designing with a junction temperature of 125. If you reduce your junction temperature, maximum junction temperature to 120, then your delta T reduces, your T j mean reduces by some extent, your number of cycles to failure now increases uh, and you get uh, about 12.5 years. If you reduce further reduce your T j max, you can end up now with 
a lifetime of, of, of the order of 41 years. Again, these are design numbers. It does not mean that your actual inverter might last for 41 years. You might have other factors which can cause different types of failure, but these are indicative numbers to see whether this particular issue might be a concern in your particular application. So, one way of uh, addressing say you have an equipment which is intended to last uh, for 10 years, then definitely this may not be a good uh, way to actually uh, do the design. You might have to select a different temperature and one way of uh, ensuring that you can actually do that is by going for a higher uh, rated current rating of the device which would uh, have typically a lower uh, uh, on state resistance with lower uh, power dissipation, also your higher current rate device would have lower uh, thermal impedance resulting in a lower Tj max, uh, you can get a improvement in your uh, cycle lifetime. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, typical data sheets do not provide uh, this level of detail of uh, IGBT data. Uh, so, to get detailed data from uh, on the modules to do evaluate cycle life etcetera, one might actually have to contact uh, design engineers or application engineers from the company to actually get the detailed information. Uh, and the thing to keep in mind is that uh, in typical applications it may not be just two temperatures that uh, one is operating, it you are, may not be just operating between say 55 degrees centigrade and 120 degrees centigrade, you might have a uh, number of temperatures over which uh, the equipment would operate. So, you might have a so, uh, you might operate at uh, at stress. sigma 1 for some duration followed by sigma 2 up to say sigma n and you might have different uh, cycles to failure rate for the different uh, temperature stretches, stresses that are being applied on the component. So, if corresponding to uh, uh, sigma 1, you might have uh, n 1 cycles to failure and corresponding to uh, sigma 2, you might have n 2 cycles to failure and uh, uh, n n cycles to failure. Uh, so, using the expression, we could actually calculate the cycles to failure for the actual uh, for under these varying conditions of stress, but your ap actual applications may not just uh, operate at n 1 or n 2 uh, cycles, you might actually operate for some small n n i uh, small n 1 op, uh, cycles under stress condition sigma 1, small n 2 under sigma 2 and small n n for sigma n. So, the question is how to actually uh, consider conditions when you are operating under conditions of varying stress rather than just switching back and forth between a minimum and maximum. So, this can be done by uh, one way to uh, look at this is what is called the uh, palm grin minor rule for damage accumulation. So, let n i be the expected cycles to failure under stress condition sigma i and small n i be the actual number of cycles operated under this uh, particular stress level sigma i. So, essentially for a given uh, component let uh, is let d f be the total damage that you can actually subject the object before it becomes non functional and let d i be the the number of the damage caused by operation under condition i. So, if you uh, if you are operating under stress condition i and d i is the damage that is caused under stress condition i, then essentially what you are doing is uh, operating under varying stress conditions you are saying that you could sum over all the stress conditions and once you reach d f, then the component is considered failed. 
or in the way to look at it you can look at the damage on a normalized basis. So, you take the damage under your ith condition divided by your damage to failure and once that sums up to 1 essentially uh, here what you have done is we have divided both sides by d f. Uh, essentially when your normalized damage reaches 1 then essentially uh, you have reached your end of life point. Um, so, for the cycles to failure uh, condition you can then express this as the summation over the number of actual cycle of operations divided by the cycles to failure numbers when that accumulates to 1 then essentially you would end up having uh, thermal cycling failure of this particular component. Uh, one thing to, uh, to consider when you are applying such a concept is that uh, uh, essentially what you are doing is uh, you are assuming that the damage accumulates and uh, uh, essentially uh, you are assuming that there is linearity in the way the damage accumulates. For example, you might have a situation where you apply uh, stress 1 which is larger and stress 2 which is smaller and you may your total damage at the end point of uh, after application of stress 2 might be something uh, and you could reverse the sequence you could apply stress 2 first and then stress 1. So, the accumulation of damage assumes that you get the same level of stress irrespective of whether you apply the larger stress first or the larger stress second. Uh, so, you are neglecting sequence effect because if you have already damage applying the same effect might cause further damage you are neglecting sequence effects when you are actually applying this particular rule. So, this is an approximation, but it gives you a way of uh, looking at how to accumulate damage when you are operating under conditions of varying stress. So, we will look at an example now of a situation where uh, you are operating under conditions of uh, varying stress. Uh, we before that uh, example we will look at what could be the procedure that we could use to actually sum up uh, sum up the stress when you are operating under such varying stress conditions. Okay. So, the contributions to stress can be not just the loading it can be just the ambient itself varying over time. And uh, many in many power, power applications you would also have some repetition rate of uh, loading uh, or ambient uh, situations. For example, in a factory you might have uh, the production duration might repeat on a daily basis. So, the equipment in the factory might get loaded under some set of conditions on a daily basis or in a transportation application you might have a typical drive cycle which is repeated on a daily basis. Uh, there might be some variations on weekends, but you might have some uh, then weekly patterns. Uh, for uh, DG applications for example, in a wind turbine you might have uh, patterns of wind which might seem random, but over longer durations your loading levels might have statistical distributions from which which might lead to similar level of loading repeating over multiple months. So, depending on your application you can have uh, repetition durations of uh, loading uh, over which you are looking at uh, how the temperature junction temperature is varying over time. So, the first thing to consider is your T rep.
So, the second step is to identify cycles to failure. or lifetimes over shorter intervals and then you calculate what is the normalized damage and then you calculate So, you calculate the number of repetition periods over which the normalized damage would reach 1 would give you an indication of what your expected uh, cycle life, service life of your equipment is for an ac actual operat operating condition. So, we will look at an example for uh, doing this particular exercise in the next class, uh, but we can see that uh, evaluating the junction temperature. Uh, the temperatures of various components is actually a very critical part of power electronic design. Thank you.